Hey, everybody. I think we are live on the technical stage here at API Days New York. And we've got a great day of content coming up here starting in just about one minute with Mike Amundsen talking about building great web APIs. And we'll wait just a little bit, let people file in. But if anybody wants to drop in the uh, stage chat, uh, let us know where you're from. Might be fun. I'm uh, coming to you live from Denver, Colorado here. It's a lovely day outside. All right. This is a fantastic uh, virtual conference platform that, man, Hopin's really cool. I got, uh, oh, we got New Jersey and Poland. Hey, David. Hey, Marius. Oh, Porto's beautiful. I'm jealous of, of Lucia over there. Man, people coming in all over. That's fantastic. Indianapolis, I, I dropped out of IUPUI. That's good. <laughs> hey, there we go. Hey, everybody. All right. Boston. <laughs> Oh, it's great to have everybody here. Sydney, man, it's late for you, Ian. Thank you so much for staying up uh, to catch this. Oh, in India too, gosh. Man, it's uh, it's definitely late over there too. Right on. Cool, well, I think we are ready to get everything started. So first up, we've got uh, Mike Amundsen, uh, author of Designing and Building Web APIs, talking about how you to build great web APIs. So Mike, take it away. Hey, how you doing? Thank you, Tony. Uh, it's good to be here. It's good to see everybody from all around the world. I love that our conferences are going virtual. So it, it's really, it's a pleasure to be with all of you everywhere. And I hope this will be a fun session today to talk about designing and building great web APIs. So uh, that's, the, that's the, the topic of the talk. And it's based on a book that I've been working on that for pragmatic publishing. Uh, first of all, this is me. This is how you can find me on LinkedIn and GitHub and YouTube and everywhere else. So please connect with me. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what you're doing and how, what you're working on and how you're building uh, and designing great web APIs. So as I mentioned, this is all from a book that I'm just completed now. I actually just turned over all of the content to editors. Uh, after reviewer feedback, we're gonna do some layouts for the next month or so, and then the book will be out. So what you're gonna see here is really just kind of a, a romp through the main topics of the book. I will point out on my YouTube channel, if you're interested, I, I get into a little bit more depth in each of these topics, and then, um, then you can actually uh, uh, follow the book yourself. So let's get right into it. We don't have a lot of time. Um, Really, I wanna, I wanna sort of give you sort of the big picture here. I wanna talk a little bit about the foundations of designing and building great web APIs. This is really all about the whole life cycle, the whole process that you go through. So I wanna talk about designing, building, and releasing. And then in sort of typical uh, style, I'm, I'm wearing my black tee today, a uh, little job style. There's one more thing that I wanna kind of talk about it at the end of that as well. But let's let's start out with some simple foundations just to sort of set, set the tone. And the two things that I wanna talk about is this notion of API first, and then we'll talk a little bit about this HTTP and web and REST and stuff like that. The APIs I'll be talking about, the design effort I'll be talking about today is focused on these RESTful APIs. I've got a whole nother series of focusing on Eventful that we'll come out with later this year. I first heard about API first from Cass Thomas in 2009. Cass is this really, really great thinker, systems thinker and, and, and programmer. Um, so what does it really mean? It means designing, uh, identifying and defining the actors and the personas, figuring out what they wanna do and, and how they wanna use their APIs. So it's centered on the user, it's centered on the people, it's centered on getting that stuff done. So uh, that's one way to look at it. So um, let's talk about API first. You're really solving a business problem, right? You're trying to figure out what are the problems of this customer and what is it that you really need? The next thing is uh, you're really designing for people. Um, you have to make sure, you know, the way you design for a C-sharp programmer is not the same as the way you would design for a JavaScript programmer. Uh, you would design things differently. So you, when you really need to know who they are and what their tools are and what their skill levels are. And then finally, 
we want to take this design first idea, this idea that we want to design things before we go racing to build them. Uh, that can be a bit of a bummer for those of us who are developers, programmers. That's how I grew up. But design first gives us a chance to focus on things that are really, really important and focus uh, on the things that will make a difference before we make a lot of mistakes. We'll talk about how we can do that. Also, I just to touch bases on this whole idea of HTTP and RAS and so on and so forth, just to clear this up. The way I look at this is they're, they're, they're related circles. They're not actually concentric like you see in this diagram here. I don't, I'm not crazy about the diagram. But the idea is HTTP is a protocol. That's the, the sort of the, the language, the way we sort of speak to each other. The, it's the air we breathe. It's the water fish uh, breathe, right? But the web is a set of practices. It's a set of common things that we do. Uh, common practices are things like driving on the left side of the road in the west and in, in the west and the right side of the road in Australia. We have all these practices that we do, right? And then rest is really the style, the style of doing something. There's no practice, there's no standard. It's just it's this sort of the style. It's like goth architecture, gothic architecture, or it's about jazz music, or it's about rap music, or it's it's uh, whatever these different styles are, the way you solve a problem. So, so at least for what we're doing in here today, we're going to focus on, on HTTP, uh, uh, the web, and REST. But you can apply these same ideas to all sorts of other things as well. So solving business problems for people and then focusing on protocol, style, and practice. That's really what we want to do from this foundational level. And that gives you a great place to start. Nobody argues about whether or not we'll use HTTP. I don't have need to argue about that. That's a foundational element. But when we get into design, that's when we start thinking about what we really want to do. And I want to talk about three uh, sort of aspects of design. Modeling, designing, and then describing. So modeling is this uh, chance to figure out what's really going on in the world. Designing is translating that into something meaningful. Describing is putting it down in a way that others can understand. So I love this thing from, from uh, uh, Donald Norman. Donald Norman wrote this book, uh, The Design of Everyday Things, and he talks about this thing called the life cycle, the action life cycle. And if you look at this action life cycle, you just got a series of steps. You know, Basically, you've got a goal, which means you need to set a plan, you specify, and you perform some action in the world. I want to turn up the heat. Okay, that's my plan. I say I, it needs to be you know, warmer. I go figure out I, uh, there's a switch on the wall. I'm going to turn that switch. Then I wait to see what happens in the world. And then I perceive the, the change, I interpret what it means, and I compare it to my goal. Okay, the fan turned on. Am I warm enough yet? Not quite. I'll, I'll wait a little longer until I finally reach my goal. And we go in this constant loop, constant loop over and over again. There's no straight lines in the world. We often, we often diagram and design things in a straight line. That's a bad idea. It's really this constant loop over and over again. And that really gets uh, uh, started with a thing called an API story. I like to use API stories similar to the way you might use a user story in a UI. So you get this idea of a simple purpose. Here in the case, we keep track of companies for Bingo Incorporated. That's our purpose. We keep track of new companies. We know what data we're going to talk about. We know what actions we're going to talk about. We may also have some things called processing or rules. This is just a really simple example. But you want to write this stuff down and write it down in a narrative way. Don't get too worried about designing spreadsheets or diagrams or UMLs or anything yet. Capture it. In a, in a diagrammatic way. Once you've captured lots of information, then you can start to talk about the design work. You can adopt this design thinking. Who's my customer? What's their job? What needs to be done? And then how can I use, how can I diagram this in some kind of way? So I, I talk about several steps, describing it, diagramming it, documenting it, and defining it. So this idea of designing is really collecting all these things so we know what the experience is going to start looking like. In wireframes, you have this notion uh, in UI, we have this notion of wireframes. So you can sort of diagram that. Uh, that's what I use diagrams for. And then very often, I use a kind of a modified sequence diagram. I've seen people use UML. I've seen people use actor diagrams, uh, all sorts of possibilities, even finite state machines. Uh, it's totally fine whatever you do. I like this idea of laying out sort of these actions I need to do and how I get from one action to another. And that's really the way I diagram it. And usually when I show it uh, to people, people can sort of get it. They don't need to understand a lot of technical details. Diagramming is really important because people mostly uh, process information visually anyway. 
Finally, I need to describe it. And I like to describe things in a very uh, sort of technology agnostic kind of way. So I and Leonard Richardson and Mark Foster and some others have put together a thing called the Application Level Profile Semantics or ALPS language. It's really a simple document form that can be translated into lots of things like WSDL or Protobufs or Async API or GraphQL or uh, just some kind of open API spec or something like that. I capture all the details, all the properties, all the actions, and put them in a form that makes sense. And this looks pretty similar to a, a lot of other languages. This is the YAML version. There's an XML version and a, and a JSON version of this. But what I'm really doing here is I'm not designing URLs. I'm not designing methods for HTTP. Because if this turns out that I'm going to do this as an eventful API, those things don't really matter to me. What matters to me for eventful APIs are things like channels and other things like that. So this is a way for me to do this in a technology agnostic way and get the design down. You can think of it as sort of a pattern, a pattern language. So modeling gets you the story, designing gets you a diagram, and describing gets you this description document. That's are sort of the same pieces. And like anything else, you'll sort of loop through these until you're satisfied that the output of your model design and description is close enough that you can start building. And if you're building in a continuous way, you can start building right away and just keep adding to it. So at some point, it's going to be time to build. And be trying to put all this together in some kind of meaningful way. And really, I want to, again, I want to talk about three different aspects of building. I always want to break this down into smaller parts. Sketching, prototyping, and then the actual building or programming. And these are really, really important because they give you a chance to exercise your brain, get people together and thinking about other things. So I got the idea of sketching uh, from Frank Geary, a physical architect who does a lot of sketching of his own buildings. I can't show Frank's diagrams uh, because they're copyright, but I can show you a sort of a similar version. Think in, in the example here, think if I'm trying to build an entryway for, for, a, for a building. Uh, I could use these big arches, long hallways. I could use a sort of an informal kind of experience. What do I want to do? So I can sketch things. Sketching APIs, uh, uh, applying the sketching, really uh, got taught to me by Ronnie Mitra. Ronnie works at Sapien Publicist today. He was one of my API Academy colleagues. He taught me how to do this. So I can sketch what it looks like to do a query. I can sketch what it looks like to get a response back for a customer record. I can sketch what it looks like to add a new record. Sketching really helps. And I use Apiary Blueprint language for sketching because I like it so much. Apiary is really based on uh, Markdown. So it's super quick and super easy for me. I can uh, sketch an interaction, one of those elements from the diagram, in just a matter of minutes, like five minutes or less. I can get both the, the response, the request and the response, and then they, they host it in a mock. So I can literally write some markdown, press F5, and I can say, hey, does this look right? Does this make sense? I can check with stakeholders, my, my developers maybe, or my, my UI designers or somebody else. So designing uh, uh, this, this kind of sketching is really, really important. Prototyping is taking a bunch of those sketches and turning them into what looks like a, a sort of a knockoff copy or a cheap copy of them. And the, the example I love to use is making a toile. If you've done any garment uh, work, if you uh, have worked in the garment industry at all, you know they make a toile, or in the US we say uh, a muslin, a copy, a prototype. Use some cheap material, work through the design, make one of them, and see if it really fits, see if it really works. If you're doing custom one-off uh, you know, uh, dresses or gowns for, say, a movie, premiere or maybe the IPO coming out party of your, you know, your, you get some, some great outfit. You don't want to use the most expensive material to see if it works. You want to use cheap material first. And that's what prototypes are about. You want to explore the details. I use open API as my cheap material because I can get a lot done in open API without writing any code. So uh, prototypes allow me to do that. So I'll actually take the sketches that I really, really thought worked and put them together and lay them out into my uh, into my prototype. And then I can actually run that mock and I can have people, even if you know maybe I'm doing modifications to APIs, I can actually have people use production clients in a test environment, or I can have people put together short test clients uh, really, really quickly and test out my prototype. Now, what's really important to think about is that prototypes need to be tested. Whereas sketches, I would toss a lot of them away, it's okay. Prototypes take longer to build. That could take me a week. It could take me a week or more to get a prototype right because I've got to export a lot of details like security and other things. So prototypes are meant to be tested over and over so I get just the right fit so that everything is going to fit just right 
when I finally start to use my expensive material, right? And expensive material is exactly what building is all about. Building your API is actually committing your description, committing your design, your OAS, your pattern to expensive materials. I think about it, if I'm building a building, I gotta dig a big hole, order a lot of cement and metal and so on and so forth, get a lot of people involved. Same thing for building an API. I might have to get a whole team of people in a corporate environment and they coordinate data services, middleware services, front end services. I gotta get a lot of people together, testing, operations, DevOps, so on and so forth. So what I wanna do when I build, I wanna make build a repeatable process. If you ever look uh, uh, to people who actually build buildings, Master contractors have this sort of repeatable method or process that they use over and over. The building's totally different, the materials are totally different, but the process is the same. So uh, that's what we wanna do. We need to be converting the prototype and designs into something real. I use a really simple framework called DART for, uh, it stands for Data Actions, Resources, Representations, and Transitions. And I do this just because it's super easy for me to translate my descriptions and designs that way. So this almost follows the story, right? You can see, here's where the data is, here's where the actions are. Resources are the actual URLs if I'm using them, or channels if I'm using an event API. Representations are gonna be the, the actual bodies of the messages, which might be really small you know, in Kafka, but it might be pretty involved if it's an HTML web page. And transitions are how I move from A to B. People skip transitions a lot, but I think they're really, really important. So here's an example of just collecting all the properties for an interface. Notice I'm not worried about a data model here. I'm on the interface side. Data models are handled by somebody else. Maybe I have to build that if I'm a single, you know, a full stack developer. But right now on the interface, I'm just interested in the properties on the interface. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting excited. Let me take a little sip of water here. Then I need some things like what are, what are required elements? Uh, what are the uh, enums? What are the uh, default values if somebody doesn't supply them? So I, that's sort of the data side. The action side is literally the function I need to do the real work. The action is not associated with a resource or a URL yet. It stands alone. So maybe I need to call out to another service. Maybe I just need to look at a data model. That's all I need there. Uh, the actual resources, in my case, since I'm talking about HTTP APIs, you can see I'm using Express here because it's easy for me in Node. I'm just gonna lay out all the resources and then I'll associate them with the actions later. Uh, and that's just fine. Um, you'll notice, by the way, you don't see any post up here. So often, this is, this is a machine API. So I'll always use put to read and write because puts are repeatable. We can talk about that some other time, but that's sort of my design of my resources. Then I need to design the representation. So I need to take that internal model of whatever I get off the database, render it as JSON, as XML, as HAL, Siren, Uber, Mason, Collection JSON, whatever the format's gonna be, even PDF maybe. Finally, I, I always define resources inside my code because I could use these later. What's the method? What's the URL? What are the arguments? What do you expect to get returned? All these things come in really handy. So that's that Dart transition that's really, really important. So sketching lets me experiment uh, and throw away things and I use Apiary Blueprint for that. Prototyping lets me explore, test, and delve into the details, make sure the fit is right, and that's really where I use OpenAPI. And then finally, I need to translate that using a repeatable process. I use Node.js in this Dart library. There are tons of libraries. There's nothing special about Dart. It's just a, a hammer that I use to solve my set of problems. So that's all I really need to focus on. But really, that's only part of the story, right? Because then you actually have to release it. And releasing isn't just putting it into production yet. You've got to have lots of other things involved. So we're going to talk about testing, security, and we're going to talk about deployment, right? So testing is super, super important. And I do this in the book and I did this in the talk, right? I should have been talking about testing in the very beginning, but the thing is, yeah, I have a talk and I have some kind of linear aspect. Just, it's a, it's a loop, right? So I'd have been testing all the way back in the prototyping or even the sketching stages, right? Once I had some mock up and running. So testing is super important, but you got to remember you're only testing the interface, not the code behind it. I don't need to test the math. I need to test whether or not the interface does what it says, allows the arguments that it says, returns the responses that it promises. There's also happy path and sad path testing. So I need to test for 200s. I need to test to make sure that it's working correct. But I also need to test for 400s. I need to make sure that it doesn't allow me to save a record that's a duplicate or save a record that's missing certain elements. So I need to write tests for both sad and happy path. 
Now I do a thing called uh, simple request test uh, uh, sets, which are really just curl with arguments. I've got a little uh, application where I can just actually build a curl, a file of all these curl requests, and then I can run them really quickly. And that's usually what I do every time I save my code on my desk, on my workstation, I'll run the SRTs really, really quickly. But when I want to get real work done, I need to use something that's that's more important than, than curl, more powerful than curl. And that's where I use Postman and Newman. And I use this uh, a behavior-driven uh, development approach. <coughs> so, so I use Postman um, uh, because I really like it. And one of the things I can do with Postman is I can actually write my own libraries. You can see an example of a library here where I actually sort of uh, optimize things. So I don't have to write really long tests. And again, just like anything else, it's repeatable. You may be writing your own testing tools. You don't need to be using Postman. Uh, Newman is sort of the command line version of that, which I really like. Uh, you could use Cucumber. You could use lots of things, whatever your whatever your your company's using. But you got to make sure you write lots and lots of tests because tests are super important. Now that also means uh, you need to focus on security for APIs. And again, you're focusing focusing on security for the interface. Who has access to the interface? Access to perform the action. In my experience, it's best to design interfaces with security in mind. In other words, don't try to use the same interface for all types of security because you're going to have a much more complicated situation, but it's entirely up to you. And I focus on three things. I focus on the encryption, the identity, and the access control. Encryption is handled through SSL. I don't need to worry too much about that. You may have some mutual TLS that you need to work on in events. That's a, that's a slightly different variation on the same idea. Identity, I usually use uh, uh, OpenAuth, OAuth. For identity. Uh, it's a great exchange, whether you're using it for local databases or remote services or using social accounts, doesn't really matter, as long as you're using this idea of a shared identity, which makes lots and lots of sense. And you can do that for machines too. Um, uh, access control is a slightly different deal. Access control actually happens in the code, at the code level. Uh, you can do some of it at the gateway level, but I like to do it at the code level because that means I need I I know exactly what's going on. I'm not dependent on a gateway upstream to to secure my service. Machine-to-machine um, -machine authorization with with uh, uh, JSON Web Tokens basically means I take part of the experience of of authentication and I move it uh, into a, like programmer space. And I use Auth0 as my tool when I'm working on these things. It's not always what I use in production, but it helps me a lot. So this is sort of the typical uh, uh, way that uh, authorization works. And what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, if you're using machine-to-machine uh, -machine language, those first two steps of actually getting the token and uh, from the OAuth provider usually happens in code. <clears throat> I even wrote a little routine. <coughs> excuse me, wrote a little routine in my testing to make sure that I get a fresh token for all of my code. So some of that happens in code; the rest happens online. So the last step is, is releasing, and there are lots of things you can think about releasing. There's integration. Uh, uh, deployment, there's uh, uh, delivery, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment, right? So you need to think about those in various levels. Continuous integration is I test every time I check in. Continuous delivery is I post to production manually every time I'm ready. Um, continuous deployment is I automatically post to production. If you're lucky enough to be in that position, that's fantastic. Automate as much as you can. But a lot of us aren't lucky enough to be in that position. We, we don't have access to production servers and stuff like that. So you need to set your own level. Automation is the key to success in all this stuff. Make sure you automate as much as you possibly can. You want to be able to repeat this over and over and over. I use Heroku Git Push. I like Git Push as a deployment method. Heroku isn't the only one that does it, but I really like it because it keeps it simple for me. It keeps it simple in the space. Your own organization may have, may have its own DevOps tooling chain, and that's perfectly fine. What I do is I actually uh, sort of automate some scripts. I, I have a launch script. You'll see when you when you when you look at the uh, at the examples in the book. I have a launch script that lets me do all of those steps uh, automatically. Runs tests locally. If the tests pass, uh, mounts them to production. Runs the tests in production. If the tests fail, backs them out of production. Right. So all of that process. Um, so this is this is actually sort of a little my little automation of the Git. Get scripts and stuff like that. I'll, I'll be sure to answer questions uh, along the way. Please keep posting the questions in, and I'll make sure I, I, I talk about them at the end. So testing interface behavior using Postman and Newman. Uh, managing uh, API security with client credentials and in, in, uh, JSON web tokens. And then automating uh, your deployment patterns with Git and push. And that's really 
what you want to focus in on this releasing stage. And like I said before, you can start this way, way back in the early in the early stages of sketches and prototypes and builds. You don't have to wait until everything is built. If you're a single, you know, if you're just a single developer, well, for all of this. But if you're a, a, a if, if not, you're going to have to get some of this alone. Okay, one more thing, and then I'll get onto it. I know Tony's appearance tells me that I'm I'm towards the end. The next thing is modifying APIs. So you need to have a, a set of challenges for how you modify existing APIs. And I'm just going to go through this really quickly. First of all, do no harm. That's your principle for updating. You want to make sure you don't break anybody. Fork what you have and launch a new one. When you design updates, you want to make sure you don't break anything. You don't take things away. You don't remodify them. Everything is optional in the future. So you don't add additional breaking changes. When you test, you have to use all your old tests and add new tests. Don't rewrite tests. Use all your old tests to confirm that they still work. When you release, the first rule of releasing is reversing. You have to be able to unrelease, uh, right? So design your updates so that you can back them out. Think about that from the database uh, standpoint. And finally, eventually you're gonna shut down the API. That means you need to put the code in public domain if you can. If you can't, at least open source the interface. Everybody's been seeing that interface. Make uh, data recoverable for people if you've been storing data. And then mark your existing API as 4.10 gone and point to maybe somebody's other open source version of that. So foundations first, API first, web and rest, model, design, describe, sketch, prototype, and build, test, secure, and deploy, and then do all those updates. I'll share all these slides. I know it's a lot at one spot, but just remember, you're trying to identify what people are trying to do and your, what the, with your APIs, and that's going to get you to where you need to go. So hopefully this has been interesting. You can get the slides at this address, and I'll also post a set into the conference. And uh, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Tony. I don't know if we have any time for questions, but Tony, maybe if we don't have time, we can sort of get a copy of the questions and I can answer them offline. Yeah, we can definitely make sure that you get a copy of the questions, Mike. And we, we are... Uh out of time as so we got to be moving on oh, to the next no that's that's all great man it's awesome <laughs> awesome content a lot of really great uh you know design first and 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 building advice for api so thank you so much um all right so next up we have uh yeah see you mike thank you so much see ya bye bye take care